Colossians chapter 3. We're going to look at verse 12. And I think when you look at that verse, it should be obvious that we're not at the beginning of a letter. We're somewhere in the middle. And we come to this verse, and it's there that we read that we're going to be commanded. This is what we'll see today. We're commanded to be compassionate, to be kind, to be humble and meek and patient people. And the way we need to understand this command to go and be these kinds of people needs to be understood not as if this is the very first thing Paul said, but needs to be understood in light of everything else Paul has already said. And so if there's some of you here this morning who might be thinking, you know, just what I expected when I come to church this morning, it's going to be this never-ending religious checklist of things to do and not to do for God. Well, today I want to challenge your assumptions and your feelings about this particular text and the commands that we get in the Bible. Because Colossians does inform us of what God requires of his people in order that we can be pleasing to him. He does tell us what those things are. But Colossians doesn't say what every other religion does. And what we've seen in the previous two chapters leading up to this this list of God's demands upon us, leading up all the way here is actually the uniqueness about Christianity that helps us flip what we normally think about this sort of command into a glorious gift. And we don't come to it as if it's a groaning grievance to us. And the gospel of Jesus Christ makes all the difference. That's what we've seen in these first two chapters. That is, that when we understand how God created the world, created humanity in such a way that we are ultimately fulfilled by trusting in the Lord and His generous provision for everything that we need. We can even see His goodness, not only in the world, but in His own commands. That He tells us, He commands us to do things that require that we trust Him. And therefore, we see that what he's doing is leading us to be ultimately fulfilled by trusting in God. But Adam and Eve and the entire human race has not kept God's law. We have rejected God's design. And we have doubted God's goodness in it. And we have rebelled against God's authority. And therefore, no one has obeyed his law perfectly, but all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And therefore, every last one of us has incurred the condemnation and the coming judgment of this absolutely holy God. And so, already, in similar fashion to other religions, we understand that we are in desperate need to appease God's wrath and to please God's rules. This is very similar to other religions. And Colossians chapter 3 verse 12 is, is telling us what God requires. He says, this is how I want you to live, to please me. You need to be compassionate and kind. You need to be humble and and meek and patient. And and while it's a relief to know what God demands of us, it, it always leaves us burdened because we are unable to do these things. It's just this constant effort, working, trying to please God and to appease Him. And I want to say that this is where Christianity differs from all the rest. It's the reason why it takes until chapter 3 before Paul gives us these commands of here's how you are to live. Here's the demands of God. And these are commands even for us believers. To be worthy of God, he tells us what is required. But we find in the previous two chapters, there is hope. There is the hope of the gospel. And so though we're dead in sin, not just lacking in the desire to obey, but also in the ability to even come close to meeting the divine demands, God still in unfathomable love sent his son into the world to carry out our salvation in our place on our behalf. And the good news is that for God so loved us sinners that he sent his son That even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so at the center of your salvation is a person, an individual, and it's not you. It is God's divine Son who became our human Savior. 
And as such, Jesus is the only one who could live a perfect life to earn our perfect obedience and to do it on our behalf. And Jesus is also the only one who has, uh, has lived a perfect life, who has lived a, sorry, who died a, a perfect death, a sinner's death, in our place in order to endure the punishment that we deserve. And therefore, through Christ's death, he has appeased, God has appeased his own wrath against our sins by punishing him, them in his son. And through Christ's life, God has pleased all of his demands of us in that he, 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 was, he receives the righteousness of, of Christ himself as our own. And so we see that salvation is the gracious gift of God to us in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. The Bible proclaims the best news ever. For sinners like us, those who are condemned, we see that he has already appeased God's wrath and already pleased God's rules. And then he freely offers himself and his reward to all those who will receive him by faith. So we might say that, that religion is trusting in your own works, but faith is trusting in another's works to be saved. This is what we've seen in these chapters leading up to this. And therefore, the focus of Colossians is less about what we do and more about what Christ has done. And for those who turn away from their sin, who see Christ as he is, they turn away and they, they come to him in faith, trusting in him. They receive gracious gifts from God in Christ. They, they receive things like deliverance from the devil's grip and redemption from a rebel's heart. And forgiveness for a failure to obey his commands. And because of these things, we are now reconciled with God. That Christ has done this so that we are now at peace with God forever. And then he's filled us with his power and his presence so that we have been transformed from sinners into saints. And all of these spiritual realities are instantaneously applied to us the moment that we put our faith in Christ. And the gospel really is the best news ever for, for sinners like us. Hence, the first two chapters have been training us, teaching us, instructing us on who Christ is, and also calling all of us to faith in Him. This is why the entire Bible is centrally concerned about the coming and the living and the dying and the rising and the ascending and the returning of Christ. Christ is all. He is our hope. He is our life. He is our glo glory. And he is our salvation. But wait, there's more. Christianity doesn't just address our failures to meet God's demands. Yes, we know that God demands of us certain things, that we must meet his standards. But Jesus doesn't just come to forgive them and uh, to forgive us and to, in a sense, direct God's attention elsewhere. Or to say, you know what, those are all gone. That's, he does more than that. He goes on to give us not just a record without unrighteousness, but to give us a record of perfect righteousness. His righteousness. Because eternal life is more than, more than just not obeying or not disobeying God. It is about obeying God perfectly according to what he requires. And though, or because of this, salvation then requires your transformation. Not just forgiveness, but a whole new person. And therefore, we are once enslaved to sin in our spirit, but then God imparts to us his own spirit. So that he will reign in us. He will transform us. And though invisible to our own eyes, this is a new person. We are new creations in Christ. And through the godly desire and the divine power that the Spirit of God now indwells us, he gives us a desire for holiness. He transforms us on the inside. He empowers us to do these things. Now we are able to fulfill the law of God. Because we now have the help we need. We are different people and we now have the ability to do so. This is what the gospel is. It includes more than, like I said, more than just forgiveness for us to go and live and be happy and do whatever we want. It is the power to live a life that fulfills the laws of God. Why should Christians live like Christ? And the reason is because Christ lives in you. 
His saving work was completed in his physical life for us, but his sanctifying work progressively continues in his spiritual life in us. And the gospel is not that the commands of God have been changed. The good news is not God lowered his standards so that we can obey them. The good news is that God has transformed his people so that we can obey them. And so as we come to the commands of Colossians chapter 3, they are not to be seen here as the demanding rules of an angry God, but the new desires of a renewed person in the image of God. This is what we should want to do. This is what we are empowered to do. And apart from faith, you look at these commands and you say, okay, I can try. But it is a heavy burden to bear. None of us can do this on our own. But through faith in Christ, it is an easy yoke. It is a light burden. And so the, the instantaneous moment of salvation comes through faith in Christ. But so does the progressive, continuous process of becoming more holy also comes through faith in Christ. And in this way, we say that Christ is all. And moreover, we will become the kind of people God created us to be. And we will meet these demands that He has on every one of us, but we will only meet them because we have Christ in us. This is the gospel. We don't do these things to be saved. We do these things because we are saved. So I want to get to verse 12 now. And I want to notice right off the top, before we've even received the first command, he will say compassionate hearts. That's what you need to put on. But before we get to what we ought to do, he again reminds us of what Christ has already done. He says, your obedience to these things are not so much to to get God to choose you or or to get God to love you or to get God to, to, to see you as holy. He says, in Christ, all of that has been secured for you. We are to live in light of His grace, not in pursuit of His grace. And therefore, in verse 12, we read this, that because of what Jesus has done in us, we are to now live. He says, put on compassionate hearts, Kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Because he's ready and willing to help us do that. That is what he gave us his Holy Spirit for. So that we could now fulfill his commands and his demands. So the analogy Paul's been using here, we've been talking about this, is is this idea of what we wear. The clothing that we put on. And because our, our transformation has been so comprehensive, this makeover has changed us entirely who we are. We are a, a whole new person in Christ. Then we should start wearing new clothes. Clothes that don't accentuate our old self that in sin, but our new self in holiness. And these are the things that we ought to put on. And these are the things that will fulfill the law of God, God's demands. And will actually, if we do this will please him. So in other words, because Christ is in us, Christ-likeness should just flow out of us. That is where we're headed in, in, through faith in Christ. And our responsibility, I want you to see that it is our responsibility. We are to put on. We are to take part in this, not wait until we feel these things, but put them on. And trust and and live according to these things, trusting that God is going to supply them by His Holy Spirit as we need them. And in all that we do so that now, it's not just that Jesus is, is doing everything in us. He is, but what happens is He gives us the power and that we find ourselves doing these very things in real time. We are actually doing it ourselves through Christ. This is how far God's salvation goes. And so we come to verse 12. We see that there's a whole paragraph here of what we could look at, and we will over the coming weeks. But to see this, what we want to do is start today in just verse 12. There are five, in a sense, articles of clothing that we are to put on. And I want to talk about these things. As we walk in Christ, these are the kinds of things we should wear. These are the kinds of things that God wants us to increase in and is causing us to do so. So if you have Christ in you, if you've received Christ, these are the kinds of things that we ought to put on. So let's look at them. The first article of clothing is compassionate hearts. Now this is more of a reaction than an action. Because the ancient uh, ancient, um, people, the world, knew that the way that our bodies would get that 
gut-wrenching feeling in our, own, in our own bodies. We would feel the pain of another person. When we, when we watch someone we love go through excruciating experiences, and we just wish that there was something we could do, anything we could do to help alleviate and relieve some of that agony for them. We feel it. Our hearts begin to hurt for them. And this is the, the compassion from the heart. This is the way that we are to live our lives. God requires this of us. He says, that's what I designed you for. You to look around and see other people in need, no matter who they are, and have compassion on them. This is what the Bible says God is full of. It says God is full of compassion. And in, in the flesh, we read that Jesus felt compassion towards the, the, the beggars, the blind, who were crying out for help. He, he felt compassion when he was watching a funeral service and those who were grieving there, he was compassionate. And the crowds who were lost in sin, he felt compassion toward them. And, and this, where, where we used to be unfazed, we would look around this world, we would say, as long as I'm okay, I'm okay. We would see other people hurting, and regardless of who they were or who they are, we just didn't feel anything. But Christ in you is causing these things to begin to grow. This is part of the fruit of the Spirit, that we begin to, to bear the fruit of Christ in us. And one of those things is compassionate hearts, that we have a tender heart toward our neighbor. And the more that we allow Christ to be in us and to work in us and to put on these things, the more they will be produced. So God, in this way, we could look at it and say God demands that people live with compassionate hearts. But then we see, according to the gospel, this is exactly why he gave us his Holy Spirit to produce in us. And so we don't wait until we feel compassion. We put it on. That means that you ask in faith, God, give me the compassion that you require. And then we live in faith, believing, seeking to be compassionate, believing that God will supply the compassion of Christ in us and through us to love those around us. And when we do this in the strength of Christ, in faith in Christ, we will actually begin to fulfill the law of God. What he has demanded and what we have failed is now possible because Christ is in us. That's the first article of clothing, but we need another one. The second article is kindness. This builds on that feeling of compassion and now acts on it. So compassion is that, just that feeling. It doesn't necessarily do anything, but it is something that we feel. Now kindness is what you do in light of your compassion. It's being concerned about your neighbor's good, whoever they may be, and your neighbor's good as much as you are your own well-being. And Jesus took on flesh to do this very thing. He was kind. Ephesians chapter 2 talks about the immeasurable kindness of God that we will praise him for. And Jesus came in the flesh. He showed the, the kindness of God toward other people. He explained what this looks like when he talked about the Good Samaritan. And he talked about this, this Samaritan who, who found a man who was typically the, the enemy of his people or at least someone that they would divide over. They didn't like each other. And yet, he saw this man in need, and he had not only just compassion, but he took care of him. And he treated this person in the way that he would have wanted to be treated if it was him in that situation. So he patted his wounds, he provided him safety, and he paid for his costs. So kindness is loving your neighbor as you love yourself. And this is what we were designed to live as. This is what God demands of people, and this is why he gave you his Holy Spirit to produce and to help you carry out these things. And so like the other one, we don't wait until we feel kind to go and be kind. We put it on. Like you get dressed in the morning. You, know, you maybe you don't feel like getting dressed, but you're getting dressed. It's a good thing. And so we put on kindness and say, God, I need kindness today. I want kindness, and I need you to provide it for me. And we go and we live as kind as we can by faith in Christ, believing that he will supply it to us as we go about. And, and, and we love others with the kindness of Christ because he is in us and he lives through us. And in this way, just like compassion, when we live by faith in the kindness that Christ will supply, we now fulfill what God has demanded of us. We are to love our neighbor as ourself. 
The third article of clothing here is humility, which is basically the opposite of pride. And the ancient Greeks, I don't know how they would say this, but they seem to have loved pride. But maybe that was too proud to say. They, they just despised humility. They didn't like it. They said that's humiliating only. And to see someone who had authority, who had power, who could exercise their rights but didn't, but was humble, they called that person a coward. They should just be a slave. They're just, they're they're wasting their, their power, their authority. But then Jesus talks about them and then he talks about himself. And he says, this is me. And in Philippians chapter two, we read this, that Christ, even though he is God and he is rightly and ready to, to get revenge on us rebels, he could do it in an instant. He could overpower us all and yet he didn't deem himself or count himself as if he was the sovereign and supreme Lord of all. He knew he was, but he counted himself as if he wasn't. And instead, he came and took the form of a servant, even became born of a human or as a human, and he humbled himself all the way to the point of death, even death on a cross. This is the humility of Christ, the humility of God. And like Jesus towards sinners like us, how humble he is toward us. We are to look at others, and even if we are are over them in a sense of authority or power, and even when they don't deserve it, we are humble, and we count others as better, as greater than ourselves. Now, This is a requirement of God, but this is why he gave you his Holy Spirit to be able to produce this, to to do these things in your own body, in your own life. And again, we don't wait to feel humble to then to go be humble. By then, it's probably too late. You, you, You put it on. And we need to take the initiative and ask in faith, God, give me this humility that you require from me. Give it to me, and I will go and I will live as humbly as I can, trusting that you will provide the humility of Christ for me that I can show to others and love them. And this is how we fulfill the demands of God, that he, through him, we are humble as he requires. The fourth article of clothing is meekness, and it, and it kind of builds on the state of mind. Humility is the way we think, and, and, and meekness is humility in action. Now we, we do something about this. We don't just count someone better, we act on it. And that is meekness. With infinitely more power than all the earthly rulers, when Jesus was here on the earth, he described the way that they exercised their power. He says, you know that the Gentiles and the, leader, the leaders among you, they lord it over you. They overpower people, and they do it because they can. They say, I have power, and I'm going to just use it for my own purposes, for my own good, and they just did it because they could. But then Jesus says, here's my almighty method of meekness. And he says, for the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So meekness means choosing to channel your power over your neighbor and instead using that to serve your neighbor. This is what meekness is and this is what God demands of of people. This is where we have failed his law. We are not meek people, but he gave us his Holy Spirit so that we could be and we will be. And so again, we don't wait to feel meek. We don't wait for that moment where we say, I want to be meek now. But, but other times when people offend me, when people hurt me, I don't want to be meek now. When I have this power, I just want to use it. But you can't just wait for it. You ask in faith that God will make you meek and provide the meekness of Christ to you as you live in faith. And when we do this, it is not your own working in you. It is Christ working in you. And God looks at his law and he says, you're doing it. Because Christ is at work in you, and you actually please your heavenly Father in this way. We do everything by faith in the power and person of Christ. This is how we are to live, and this is what God gives us his Holy Spirit for. And that fifth article of clothing is patience. And it takes this humility thing one step further. So being humble is a state of mind, how you think. And then we have meekness, which is humility in action. You're, You're being meek. And then patience is a reaction. 
So let's say you now count people better than yourselves and you in meekness are serving them. You're giving to them. You're using your power to serve, to love them. But then that person doesn't appreciate it. They don't realize what you're doing. They don't even care. And they sort of abuse it. They say, well, I know this guy's a nice guy and I'm going to let him continue to serve me. And so they don't appreciate it. What do you need in that moment? Patience. And we think about the humility of God and the way that he has been humble toward us in his incarnation and our salvation. We see the meekness of God, how he came to serve us, even though he had every right to demand that we serve him. And then here we are in this world continuing to refuse and abuse the immeasurable love of God. He is patient toward us. And listen to 2 Peter 3, explain why God delays his final judgment of all the, this world, where all the sinners who continue to rebel and sin against God, why hasn't he come yet? And, and 2 Peter 3 says, it's because the Lord is patient toward you. This is divine patience. He says, not wishing that any should perish, no matter how bad they may be, he doesn't wish that they would perish, but that all should reach repentance. And so this divine patience is the kind of patience that we ought to have with our neighbor, whether they deserve it or not, whether they abuse our, our love and our service and we don't, or we're not respected or honored even when we deserve to be, we are to be patient. And just like God is, we are to live our lives like this. This is his requirement of his human creatures. And so he has to give us his Holy Spirit be able to do these things. And we don't wait until we're feeling patient. Just like the other ones, it's too late. Now I'll be patient. Well, it's, it's, it's too late. We got to put this on. We have to proactively go to God, ask him in faith, say, God, I need patience, your patience. And then to live trusting that he will supply it as you need it. And in doing so, you walk by faith in Christ. In a sense, you put on Christ who is in you. And by living this way, and only in this way, can we fulfill the law of God. And we look at this and say, this is not just a religious checklist. These are demands of God, but he's also supplied us with the power, the person who is able to help us to do these things. And this is how we please God. We walk worthy of him. And it starts with what we put on. And so these are just five examples. There's many more in this paragraph that we'll continue to explore. But these are the kind of things, the kind of living that God requires of his people. We are to be holy just as he is holy. And as the Bible enlightened us, no one is able to do these things. No one can fulfill his law unless they trust in Jesus Christ to do so for them and in them and through them. The beauty of Christianity is that God has placed everything we need into his son, Jesus Christ. And then he sent him to, this is the good news, to come and pay for our sins and to pave the way for our righteousness and give it all to us by faith in him. All who trust in him, who have received this mercy, God will not stop at anything to make you perfect and blameless and blemishless before his Father in heaven. In the sight of God, that is his ultimate goal. And this is not just a spiritual status that he gives to us early on. This is also the daily living. You and I will practice these things, able to carry them out because Christ is in us. And therefore, we can come to this list of commands. We are to do these things. But the way in which we do them, the fact that we have his spirit changes it from a groaning grievance to say, oh, I got to do all of these things now. I'll never be able to do it to a glorious gift to say, God, you can do this through Christ in me. And therefore, we have joy. We have hope. We have peace. We have everything we need to be able to come to a list like this and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. It's not because of the greatness of our faith or our works, but because of the greatness of the one in whom our faith is in and his works for us. He is faithful. He is powerful enough. He, Christ, is all. And I want you to think as we wrap this up here, 
I want you to commit yourself to trusting that God will provide for you through His Spirit in you everything we need to, as a church, display the truth and love that we proclaim, the gospel that we proclaim. And may the world watch us, look at us, and see something like no other religion, that our God lives in us and is working in us and is helping us to love like He loves. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for speaking to us through your word. We thank you for the way that you are holy and you call us to be holy like you. And while we all take the time, it's, it's very obvious that we all fail to obey you the way that we ought. It's pretty quickly seen that we don't have the strength to be able to do the things that you require of us. But we see good news and that you have saved us from our sins by Christ. You have given us his righteousness so that we are clean and holy before you in him. And now in this life, before you return again, before we are perfected in an instant when you return, we are now growing in this. As we walk in faith, teach us, Father, to put on Christ to live in light of the power and the person who is in us. And I pray that you would give us confidence, not in ourselves, but in he who dwells in us, your Holy Spirit. I pray that you would continue to minister to us these ideas and these commands, but also the fact that you are with us in all these things. And that through Christ, we can, in our daily living, walk worthy of the Lord. It is all by grace. It is all through faith and it is all in Christ that we can please you. I pray, Father, that you would make us a church that commits to trusting in Christ in all things so that we live more like him, that our church, this family, looks more like him and that the world, when they look at us, will see him. So we ask you to do these things, these miracles in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen.